With SQLite.NET added to our projects, we're ready to start interacting with the database. Now the first step is to create a connection, and this is the object that talks to the local database. SQLite.NET establishes a connection through the SQLite connection object. And when created, you must pass in the file name for the database. This will open an existing database or create a new one if it isn't present. And you must pass in a fully qualified file name and that path must be writable unless you tell SQLite.NET the database is going to be read only. And we'll talk about how to do that in just a moment. Now, if an invalid path is passed in, such as string.empty, an exception will be thrown. Now, each platform has a unique place where you typically store a database. On Android, the files will be placed in the database folder. On iOS, files will be placed in the library folder or possibly a subdirectory. And on Windows Phone, the database would go into the local folder. And that can be reached by using applicationdata.current.localfolder.path. Now, when creating a connection, there are two forms of the constructor. Now, generally, you just want to pass in the file name, but there is a second constructor that accepts two additional arguments. The first is open flags, and this allows you to control the underlying OS file handle characteristics. For example, you can use it to set your database to read only, and this would potentially improve performance. The second is store date time as ticks, and this decides how date time objects are persisted to the table and you would really only set this to false if you needed the columns in the database to be human readable. Generally, it's preferred to leave them as ticks. Now let's talk about what we need to do as developers to map our classes to tables. We would first define our class in C Sharp. And a table can be created based on the shape of that class through SQLite.net. So we do a code first approach. Let's use this person model object as an example. What we would like is a table with columns for the ID and the name. And the database schema gets defined through attributes that we apply to the class and the public properties. We see the table attribute, and this maps our class to a SQLite table, and we use attributes to map properties to columns. As well, these attributes can be used to place constraints or restrictions on the data being stored. For example, we can enforce uniqueness or limit length. And SQLite.net includes several attributes to fully define the mapping between an object and the table. We saw table already. This indicates that our class is going to be mapped to an underlying SQLite table, and the name parameter here is required. Column indicates that a property is mapped to a column in the table, and again, the name parameter is also required. Primary key is what indicates that a property is to be used as that primary key. And this is almost always an integer, but that is not a hard requirement. Auto increment will cause an integer's value to be automatically increased when a new object is inserted into the database. Index creates an index on the column with the underlying SQLite table. Max length, this restricts the length of a text property when the value is being added to the database. Unique limits values in the underlying table column to be unique, and this means we can't have duplicate values within the same column. Not null indicates that the column is to never be null. We can't add null values. And we have ignore. This can be placed onto public properties which you do not want to add to the table. SQLite.net automatically maps our C sharp types to SQLite types. And from a C-sharp perspective, we're generally not too concerned with this mapping, but it's interesting to see that enumerations and booleans are stored in the integer type. And all of our floating point types, so doubles, float, and decimal, are stored in the 64-bit real SQLite type. Now, once we have a class decorated with attributes, we use the createTable method on our SQLite connection to create the table. And it will create the table for the class if it doesn't exist, and if it does exist, then this call has no effect. However, if additional decorated properties are added to the class, then the call to create table will add the new columns, but it won't change the schema in any other way. For example, it won't alter types or delete columns. Now with the table created, we can perform CRUD operations on it in a strongly typed fashion using your entity classes. Now, once we have a class decorated with attributes, 
we use the create table method on our SQLite connection to create a table. And it will create a table for the class if it doesn't exist. And if it does exist, then this call has no effect unless you've added additional properties to the class. And then the call to create table will add new columns, but it won't change the schema in any other way. For example, it won't alter types or delete columns. And now we're ready to perform our CRUD operations in a strongly typed fashion. So for example, we can now use the insert method on our SQLite connection, passing in an instance of the class containing the data that we wish to insert. And we get a return value that indicates the number of rows that were inserted. And keep in mind, the class that represents the table must have a primary key defined. And to retrieve records within a table, we can simply access the table method, again from our SQLite connection, and call the toListLink extension method. This will execute the query and return the results. And behind the scenes, SQLite.net retrieves the list of records from the underlying table and converts the results to an object based on the attribute mappings.